so I'll try and focus this talk a little bit more mathematically and a little less biologically than, uh, than, than I sometimes do, but uh, I'll still have a little smattering of biology in there to motivate things. Um, so I'll, I'll put this up here just since I'm the first talk by way of an introduction, right? So this is, this is just sort of the generic structural biology field, right? You've got from NMR, which gives you really high resolution and a lot of dynamic information about very, very small things, uh, all the way up to sort of super resolution fluorescence microscopy, which just tells you where things are with great precision, but doesn't give you an actual structural information about those things. Uh, now, the reason I bring this slide up is because fairly recently, AlphaFold happened. Uh, and AlphaFold had a tremendous impact on uh, the structural biology field just in the sense that, oh, wow, you, you know, we've got structures now of some sort of structure now of just about everything. Uh, and uh, for the most part, the structures seem to be uh, pretty good. Uh, now, this has a lot of positive impacts. It also has some negative impacts. The negative impact being that not all the structures are perfect. Uh, some of the structures, uh, you know, the last half of the structure just wraps around the whole thing. So there are, there are definitely failure cases in there. And it isn't always going to be clear to uh, uh, someone who's just looking through alpha fold structures which ones are reliable and which ones aren't. But by and large, it's certainly going to be a very useful tool. And in a certain sense, this actually almost takes cryoEM back. Uh, to, the, to the 2000s when cryo-EM wasn't doing as high, you know, really high resolution structures. So in the early days of cryo-EM, you would solve your structure at, you know, maybe eight angstrom resolution or nine or 10 angstrom resolution. Hopefully you could begin to see some secondary structure. Uh, uh, and then you would take crystal structures of smaller pieces and, and dock them in. This was a big thing back in the, in the 2000s. And now with AlphaFold, again, what you see happening is a lot of people are, are taking AlphaFold models and using them as starting points, even though we have high resolution data now coming out of cryo-EM. Uh, and the one thing that AlphaFold still really can't help with at all uh, is this issue of, of flexibility and variability. And if we're talking about flexibility and variability in the context of a cell, uh, it's very unlikely that you're going to see any real progress from the computational perspective, from a simulation perspective, that's going to give us really good insights on what's going on in, in a cellular context anytime in the, in, in the near future. So we still need to look at, look at data. So uh, there are two general strategies in EMAN2. EMAN2 is the software that, that my group develops. There are two general sort of deep learning strategies that we've, we've adopted in EMAN2. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, designed to uh, annotate tomograms. So if you have a, a, a tomogram, a three-dimensional volume of a cell, and you need to figure out what the different bits are, that sort of thing. So we have a convolutional neural network strategy, which, which has been used for that. And that, that's been around for a while. Uh, but then this uh, deep learning Gaussian mixture model is, uh, is, is a bit newer. And that's what I'm going to be spending most of my time on today. Um, so I'm going to start with a little bit of motivation. Uh, so this is a paper that was uh, just published earlier this year. Uh, it was a humongous group of people who collaborated on it. There were, there were six different PIs, four joint corresponding authors, four joint first authors, just a humongous group of people that co uh, cooperated on this project. And there were two completely separate results. One result was doing traditional single particle cryo-EM. So you, you, you purify the nuclear pore complexes, uh, you, you put them on a grid, you image them in all random orientations, and then you do a, a single particle reconstruction to get the high resolution. Uh, and this was notable because uh, uh, we actually got to sub-nanometer resolution in uh, the, the, uh, the, the structural por portion of the pore here, right out here. You can actually begin to sort of see alpha helices. Now these, these pores are humongous. Uh, even though we're just getting to sub-nanometer resolution, that's because they're, they're massively larger than, you know, even virus particles. Um, now, the problem with single particle analysis on something like a nuclear pore complex, uh, which is, you know, responsible for exporting and importing all of the stuff into the nucleus of the cell, uh, so it spans the inner and outer membranes of the cell. The problem with, with purifying it is that you have to break off the membrane bits that are, that are stabilizing it. Uh, so there should be membranes running in here and then running out here in these structures. And they've, they've mostly been removed, and that makes some parts of the structure sort of fall apart a little bit more. And it means that the stuff in the middle, this is a, this is a, a pore, a channel complex, means the stuff in the middle is just sort of whatever happened to you left during the purification. It's sort of sitting in the middle. It's not involved in actively transporting anything. All right. Now, the alternative approach to single particle analysis, now for looking inside cells, 
is to use uh, something called a, a FibSim or CryoFibSim nowadays. So it's a single instrument that has a, a focused ion beam, which can be used both for imaging and for milling away little bits of, of, of specimen uh, and a scanning electron microscope. Uh, and what this allows you to do uh, is take, say, a cluster of cells. That's what we're seeing up here. There's a, there's a reason this is so small. We'll see in a minute. Uh, so what you see up here is a cluster of yeast cells sitting on a grid. Uh, and then you can mill out a lamella. Basically, you mill away all of this and all of this, and at the end, you leave behind just this thin slice through the cluster of cells, uh, which you can then, uh, then image here on the, on the scanning electron beam. Uh, and then you'll move into a particular area, and then you'll collect three-dimensional tomograms. You'll take this, the specimen out, you'll put it in a, a transmission electron microscope, and then uh, we'll do uh, uh, tilting of the specimen. So we also have a complete pipeline in EMAN2 for doing this, this sub-tomogram averaging and the, uh, the tomography, uh, tomographic reconstructions and stuff. You basically put the specimen in the microscope, and then you tilt the specimen to different angles, uh, and then you reconstruct it by back projecting into Fourier space. Uh, now, since the specimen is flat, we can't rotate it 360 degrees. So while it's three-dimensional data that we're getting, uh, it has poorer information along the, along the z-axis because of this sort of missing wedge. And since the steps are the, the, uh, uh, the tilts are taken generally in finite steps, there's also gaps between the slices in Fourier space. We don't have complete information, uh, but, but still we have, have some three-dimensional information at least. And since it's a cell, uh, we can't average the whole cell. We don't have several identical whole cells that we could average together like single particle analysis. So there's nothing we can do to sort of fill in this missing information uh, experimentally. You'd have to do it computationally in some fashion. Okay, uh, so now I'll fill in the bottom part of the slide, which is then we, get, we, we do the tilt series, we do the, the uh, cryo-ET reconstruction, and now you can see this is a slice through the three-dimensional reconstruction, and you can see here this is one of the nuclear pores, this is another one, that's the inner membrane and the outer membrane of the nucleus of the cell, so we can actually box out these nuclear pore complexes from the cell itself, uh, and then we can do subtomogram averaging. So now what we see is on the top, we see the single particle analysis, which was done on the purified protein, and on the bottom we see the results of the in situ analysis, so the analysis of the nuclear pores that were still inside the cells. Uh, and you can see, obviously, this is much lower resolution. Uh, when we do this, we discover that the, the resolution when we do the subtomogram averaging seems to get stuck at around 30 angstroms. That's not a necessary result of doing this sort of subtomogram averaging. We can routinely do subtomogram averaging to five, six, seven angstrom resolution now without, without difficulty. So there's something about the specimen which seems to be making it difficult to get to high resolution in the case of, of the in situ work. Uh, so this is the explanation for why. Uh, so this is just 3D classification that was done on uh, a bunch of the different nuclear pore complexes. There's about a thousand of the NPCs that were boxed out in this case. So we did 3D classification. What we're looking here, oops, sorry, what we're looking at here are slight orthogonal slices through the middle of the NPC in three different orientations, just to sort of give you an idea of what's going on. And you can see there's a lot of variability associated with these inner and outer membranes of the nucleus, uh, and uh, things are moving around a lot to accommodate all of, that, uh, all of that behavior and that sort of thing. So this is an example of the sort of thing that happens when you look at what's going on actually in the cell rather than, than just looking at things in a, in a test tube. Um, so, Step back to single particle analysis, and I'm going to show an example here. This is an example that I also used 14 years ago. Um, so uh, th this, is a, this is fatty acid synthase. It's one of the most uh, uh, dynamic molecules that I know of, so it's, it's a really pretty example. Uh, so this is just looking at that molecule from the, from the top down, top view. We can overlay a crystal structure on top of that. It's a low resolution crystal structure, but still uh, a crystal structure on top. And you can see you get sort of good general agreement there but the cryo-EM map was very blurry. Um, and uh, this is what happens if you look at the cryo-EM data for this molecule. Uh, so this is a multi-enzyme complex. It has, uh, it has seven different enzymatic activities lining this pocket and this pocket over here. Uh, and uh, to visit all of the different enzymatic activities, the substrate has to bounce all around in space and the whole complex is sort of moving around to, to adapt to it. So this is another example of something that we would need to have good uh, variability analysis to look at. 
All right, uh, my acknowledgement slides are all at the beginning of my sections, just uh, because I've got several different sections and I need to, to you know, make sure I acknowledge everyone properly. So the Gaussian mixture model method was part of uh, Muyuan Chen's uh, thesis. Uh, Muyuan moved to Stanford, to Slack, uh, uh, at the beginning, beginning, beginning of this year. Uh, the, the work was really five or six years ago when it was sort of started. We just didn't get it published until, uh, until uh, last year. Uh, and we've continued to do some development on this since then. So I'll start by introducing sort of where this, where this method started out and, uh, and then take you to where we are now. All right, so fundamentally the idea is to uh, come up with a reduced representation for whatever molecule it is you're interested in looking at uh, as a proxy, uh, which you can then use to look at the dynamics at any particular level of detail. Now, there are other approaches, manifold learning methods that people are using in cryoEM right now, and you'll be hearing about those in other talks in the meeting, uh, which don't take this approach and simply look at the raw image data and then try and learn the dynamics from the raw image data. Uh, but we believe having this sort of proxy, uh, this intermediate representation, is actually important for a number of different reasons. So you can do this either very coarsely or you can do it very fine grained. So this is a, obviously the sort of the coarsest representation that would be meaningful in this case. You basically put one blob in each of the lobes of the, of the structure right here. Uh, and of course, each of these is a Gaussian, so it has five parameters. You've got X, Y, Z location width and amplitude. Um, so we put the Gaussians in space, uh, and then once we have our, our 3D Gaussian model, uh, we know the orientation of each of our raw particles, because we've already done a, a single particle reconstruction. So we know the orientations of all of our particles. Uh, so we've got our three-dimensional Gaussian model, so we can generate a projection computationally of the, uh, uh, of the pr individual particle that we're looking at. Uh, so we know the orientation, we make a projection, and then we can compare these two and sort of see how well they agree with each other. Uh, so this gives us our, our energy function or our loss function for, for, for the purposes of, uh, of deep learning. Um, now, this will obviously be limited to a particular resolution range. If you have very large Gaussian blobs, obviously there's no point in doing very, trying to do a very high resolution similarity measurement. If you put lots and lots of Gaussian blobs in, then, then you can push it out to higher resolution. Now the measurement that we're using, the metric that we're using for measuring similarity between these two is known as Fourier ring correlation coefficient. Uh, it's the two-dimensional equivalent of the Fourier shell correlation, which is used to measure the, uh, the resolution in cryo-EM maps when you, when you do refinements. Uh, and there's some important reasons why we use that as a, as a similarity metric, which I'll, I'll get to. Now, just a, a very quick one, two slides here on, on standard deep learning protocols. So what, what, what we're using in, in this is basically just a standard feed-forward neural network. Uh, so fully connected, uh, dense layers. Uh, and the idea is if you have, say, eight neurons here, uh, and then eight neurons here, eight neurons here, et cetera, uh, then the connections are between every neuron here and every neuron here, so you have a matrix containing the weights, 64 weights. Uh, then there's also a, a bias when you come out of each neuron, so there are only eight of those. So we have 64 weights and then eight bias values, uh, and then we go through an activation function before we go to the next layer and, and so on. Uh, and this, this, of course, is the only nonlinearity that exists, whatever activation function you're using uh, in this system. If you didn't have an activation function, uh, basically this would all collapse down to just a single linear algebra operation. Um, anyway, this is sort of the important point, that you have this 64 value uh, weight matrix for these eight neurons. Now, if you think about the situation where you wanted to look at even a fairly small image, 100 by 100 pixels, then you've got 10,000 pixels in the image. And if you want to just put those into a, a normal neural network, not a convolutional neural network, but a, a standard neural network like this, you'd need 10,000 neurons, which would, of course, mean that you'd need, at each layer of the network, you'd need 10,000 squared uh, weights in the network. So you'd just have a massively large network. Now, if you imagine doing that on, say, a a 256 by 256 image, or a 512 by 512 image, or, or maybe a 64 by 64 by 64 volume, or something like that, the, the number of weights just becomes ridiculous. Um, now, there are various approaches you can use to get around this. As I say, convolutional neural networks are one common approach, but, but of course that, that imposes other uh, restrictions on the, on the system. So, uh, we went a different way. Uh, so, we structured the neural network uh, very much like an autoencoder. 
So an autoencoder is a type of neural network where basically you, you start with a, a large amount of information, you end up with the same large amount of information on the output, uh, and then in the middle you sort of force the network to reduce the representation. It's more or less the, uh, the deep learning equivalent to principal component analysis. Uh, so in the middle of the network, you wind up with this, this latent space vector, which is very small. Typically, we use a four-dimensional latent space here, four or five dimensions. So this would be sort of the reduced representation of whatever variability you're looking at in the system. Now, this isn't quite an autoencoder, because what we're putting in and what we're getting out isn't exactly the same thing. It's just similar in our case. Um, so we have this latent space, and the... Uh, uh, decoder part of the network, so this part of the network here is basically taking any point in that four-dimensional latent space and turning it into a set of Gaussian parameters. Okay, so for each Gaussian we have m Gaussians, and each Gaussian we have five parameters. So we have m times five parameters coming out. Uh, so for any point in latent space we should be able to have a three-dimensional configuration of Gaussian locations. Once again, once we have that three-dimensional representation. Uh, we can make a projection to compare it to any individual particle image, uh, and we can compute the Fourier ring correlation, and then that gives us a score. Once we have our score, we can then use backpropagation and then train the network back to the latent space, given a set of particles as references. And then we can sort of force the decoder to learn the system. Now, there's another part to this. We, we, could, we, could, we could just train the decoder part of the network and force it to sort of learn the variability that was present in the system, uh, but then the, the latent space wouldn't really have any specific meaning. We'd also like to be able to produce latent spec, uh, space vectors from individual particle images. So what we do is we take the individual particle and we come up with a reduced representation for the individual particle. Uh, in this case, we basically take, uh, we take a neutral configuration of all the, the blobs. We fit the Gaussian blobs into an average structure produced with all of the data. Um, and then we can compute the gradient of the energy with respect to each of the five different Gaussian parameters for each of the Gaussian blobs. So basically you look at one particular Gaussian ball and you say uh, which direction is the energy gradient for this? Is it which way would it want to move in X, Y, and Z to better fit that particular particle? Which way would it change the amplitude to better fit that particle? And so on. And that set of gradients then gets fed into the network. This representation doesn't change. We're, we're computing the gradients with respect to a fixed single Gaussian configuration. We're not, we're not uh, using a dynamic configuration to generate that. So we can compute this just once up front for all the particles, and basically we then have a representation for each particle uh, which, which is re rephrased in terms of the Gaussian blobs. Then that gets fed into the network, and hopefully it will produce a unique, vector, uh, unique, unique position in this latent space. All right, let's take a look at a result. I'll get back to the, the latent space a little bit more because I, I realized that was a rather quick explanation. So this is a very standard problem that people have been using in uh, single particle uh, in single particle analysis uh, uh, flexibility studies uh, to sort of test methods. Uh, so this is a, an L17 depleted 50s ribosomal subunit. Uh, basically, it's a it's a chunk of a large large subunit of ribosome which is associating and disassociating, uh, disassociating lots of pieces. So it's undergoing a lot of dynamics and solution. If you look at the original paper that was published on this, they used the traditional cryom approach of sequential classification. So you basically, you, you classify the particles into five different classes, and you pick the ones you like, uh, and then, uh, then you say, oh, well, this one I'm going to take, and I'm going to classify it further into three different classes, and then this one I'm going to classify it further into five different classes. So the, the, when this was originally published, there were 18 total maps which were produced from one single data set of heterogeneous particles. So when we just toss this now, so to do this, this took you know, a person sitting there you know, classify, running all these big classification refinement jobs, and then, okay, taking each of the individual results, and then running another one, and then running another one, and running another one, just effort after effort after effort. Uh, so in this case, all we have to do is we take the all the data we saw, the single map from the data, just a single sort of averaged map from all of the data, and then we toss it at the, the deep learning uh, Gaussian mixture model. Um, now again, the output, that latent space, uh, is a four-dimensional space. 
difficult to visualize. So in this case, we used a, a TISNY. It's just a dimensionality reduction algorithm uh, to reduce the four-dimensional space, which is kind of vaguely represented as that, down into two dimensions and sort of try and preserve some of the relative distances between things. Uh, and then we used a DB scan algorithm to just to classify the different lobes. You can, already, you can tell that we could have classified it further than this, but we just started with sort of the first six large obvious classes that, that come out of this. Uh, and you can see we get these, these six different populations out. Uh, and those different populations, we're just going to compare them visually here to each other. Uh, these different populations uh, uh, represent different states of association and disassociation of different components. And these states that we see here match very nicely with the states that were solved using the classification-based approaches. So this is what you get when you apply this Gaussian mixture model to a, a system with uh, uh, discrete variability, right? So what we're looking at here primarily is association and disassociation of ligands. So it's either there or it's not there. We're not talking about arms waving around in space or something like that, which are undergoing continuous motion. All right, so that's, I'm going to skip over that, and I'll just take you to a second example. This is an example of the precatalytic spliceosome, uh, and when you apply that to this, this is a, a more continuous variability case, uh, and we can find several different uh, motions that, that it's undergoing. Um, you can see two of them represented here. Uh, so this is just an example that the, that the method can sort of immediately produce these, these different uh, uh, results, both in the case of continuous and discrete variability. Uh, skip to another uh, bigger example now. Uh, so this is an IP3 receptor. Uh, this is a, a calcium channel which uh, sits in the endoplasmic reticulum uh, and, and lets calcium out of the stores in the ER at appropriate moments in time. Uh, again, this is a large collaboration. Uh, Irina Sereshev's group at uh, UT Health uh, is, is, the, the is the lead on this project, but uh, we've been collaborating on this for, for many, many years. All right, uh, so just, I'm going to skip over most of this biology fairly, fairly quickly. Uh, IP3 receptor uh, is, is pretty much everywhere in, uh, you know, in all eukaryotic cells. Uh, there are specific forms that are used in specific cell types, uh, but it responds to a tremendous number of different stimuli. There are, uh, you know, over 100 now known modulatory ligands. In other words, 100 different molecules which if they're present, will impact how this channel releases calcium. All it does is releases calcium, but it releases calcium in a very precisely controlled way. Um, okay, another important thing to note about these, these uh, calcium release channels is they have an interesting behavior, which is uh, they need both calcium and IP3 to activate. Uh, at very low concentrations of calcium, you just, thus don't have any activation. Uh, once the calcium concentration hits a particular level, a threshold level, uh, let's see, yeah, act, right, right around here, uh, you start getting activation. The channel opens and lets bursts of calcium out. But if the calcium concentration gets higher, it then starts deactivating again. Okay, so the calcium acts as both an activator and an inhibitor, uh, depending on the concentration level. All right. Um, so if we look at this, there are a bunch of different calcium binding sites. There's one IP3 binding site. Uh, it also uh, can bind uh, ATP. It doesn't hydrolyze ATP, though. So this is an important thing to understand about this molecule. This molecule undergoes all of these very complicated behaviors, but it doesn't really have any energetic source. It's, it's not hydrolyzing ATP to open or anything like that. Uh, so basically all of the action of this object has to be entropic. So it, you know, when you say the channel is opening, it's not a, a mechanical process where something comes in and binds and that forces it to change state. There's no energy to force it to change state. Basically, it has to be moving around in some entropic neighborhood and when something comes in and binds, that will just alter the entropic neighborhood that it's wandering in, right? So it's using entropy as, as more or less the source of energy for, for its various operations. So if we apply deep learning to the, to the, deep, the, the Gaussian mixture model to this, we can see uh, this, this motion of from the open to closed state of the channel. Um, so you can very clearly see this sort of twisting motion. Uh, these helices sort of intersect, these four helices sort of intersect in such a way that, that as it twists and rearranges, uh, it, it, it can let uh, ca calcium go through. 
Uh, there's also another domain up here, a beta trefoil, a trefoil domain, uh, which ties to these helices which twist around each other, which are also part of this, of this activation process. But there are a tremendous number of different sites, as you can see these points down here, which are involved in regulating and activating uh, the IP3 receptor. Uh, this is just looking then at that other part, this, this top domain. This isn't the channel. This is actually another set of four helices which interact in the top cytosolic domain of the, of the, uh, of the channel. Um, and we can see that it's tied to the motion in this ARM2 domain. And when we focused the Gaussian mixture model in on this uh, region, uh, you can see that this ARM2 domain shifts. Let me see... There we go. You can see this starred location, how the starred location looks like this at one extreme and it looks like this in another extreme. So that shifting is, is tied to the activation of the, uh, the IP3 receptor. Okay, now we have some problems with this Gaussian mixture model as I've, I've been showing it to you so far. Um, so we have a five parameter Gaussian representation. That itself doesn't take much memory. In fact, we, we picked that because it was a relatively reduced representation, so we wouldn't have to have as many neurons in the network. But uh, it turns out that because of some limitations in TensorFlow, uh, to produce the, uh, I'm gonna have to skip back a little, uh, to produce the uh, projections that we need here to compute the energy function, uh, uh, TensorFlow requires us to basically make one image for each Gaussian. So the amount of memory required scales very quickly with the number of Gaussians in the model. And this caused us a lot of problems for uh, uh, some time, for several years. Uh, we finally, I finally found a solution to that problem a few months ago. Actually, Muyuan first found one solution, which kind of partially solved the problem, uh, but then I solved it a different way uh, after, after he left. So we've made a number of changes now to our, our structure that, that appears in that paper last year, uh, which, has, oops, which has solved a bunch of these problems. Uh, so, we have the problem of large RAM requirement, mostly because of, because of this, this need to generate these images. Uh, we also have this issue that uh, we're computing these, these gradients, these energy gradients with respect to each of the Gaussian uh, balls. Uh, and uh, the image data is very noisy, right? The individual particles you saw, I showed a few individual particles. They're extremely noisy, so the amount of information you get out of individual images is a little bit limited, and when you compute gradients with respect to very noisy images, you tend to get fairly poor results. There's a lot of noise in the gradients. Um, so that's, that's, that's a little bit of a problem as well. And what that leads to, that means that the, the information that we're putting into the in encoder end of the network is kind of noisy, and that leads to noise in the latent space. So you still get a good representation of the dynamics of the system, uh, but the specific latent space coordinates of each of the individual particles may be kind of smeared out and hard to, hard to classify accurately. So anyway, we have that problem. Uh, and then if we want to do subtomogram averaging, so if we want to apply this to those in situ results I was talking about before, uh, we, we have the issue that, uh, you know, cryo-EM is dose limited, right? Uh, the reason our images are so noisy is because we're destroying them as we're imaging them. Uh, if you do tomography, uh, you then have to, you're putting your specimen in the microscope and then you're tilting it, you're collecting maybe 30 or 60 or 10, depending on your parameters, different images of the same area of the specimen, which means you have to use less, even less dose for each of those images in the tilt series. So if you look at a single tilt image of a single particle or a region of a cell, it's extremely noisy. You barely, barely can see anything in it at all. Um, so we have to have some strategy for dealing with, with this sort of thing. The, the, you know, the per particle per tilts have very, very high noise levels, uh, which means that we'd like to consider all of the different tilts for one particular region of the image, one particular particle, all together as one set. But if we have, say, 60 different tilt images, that requires us to use a large batch size when we're training the network, because we, then, we ne then need 60 images for each particle, and then we may need you know, 10 or 20 particles to do, get good training in the batch. So now we, we've just got these very large numbers, and it becomes challenging. Uh, anyway, so we've got all these different problems, and we've sort of reworked the network now uh, to, to get around almost all of these issues. Uh, so one thing, the first thing that we did uh, is we reduced the Gaussian parameters from a five-parameter model to a four-parameter model. 
the width parameter is actually not very useful. You're sort of defining how, how wide you want the Gaussians to be when you first fit the Gaussians of the model. If you only put six in, you're going to have wide Gaussians. If you're going to put 100 in, then you're going to have much narrower Gaussians to properly represent the data. So we don't really need that parameter. And it turns out if we get rid of that parameter, we can replace our Gaussians with delta functions. Uh, and since we're using a Fourier ring correlation function, which is insensitive to the width of Gaussians, uh, we, we actually don't have to do anything. We can actually just put delta functions in and completely ignore the width of the Gaussians and immediately compute our energy functions. Okay? So this was one key. So by doing that, by converting the Gaussians into delta functions, we basically solved all of the memory limitation problems. Because uh, we no longer have to generate an image for every Gaussian. Now we can basically just plop delta functions down in the image in appropriate places. Uh, and then, and then uh, it still preserves all of the same phase behavior as the Gaussians would have. So everything is fine. We still allow amplitude to vary, just not, uh, just, just not width. Okay, so that was the solution, part, solution to part of the problem. Uh, the next thing we did is... Here, we were computing the gradient with respect to all five of the Gaussian parameters. Um, the position parameter is sort of the most problematical parameters in terms of noise sensitivity. So we actually just took those completely out of the model, entirely out of the model. So uh, instead of computing the, the gradient with respect to all five parameters, now we're only computing the gradient with respect to amplitude. Okay, so we have our neutral Gaussian model. Uh, and then we're only computing amplitude gradients, and we're putting the amplitude gradients in over here. Now, that has some issues, right? Because, you know, if, if for example, this, this lobe that you see here was shifted up here instead, then we're only detecting that in terms of, of a change of amplitude, and we're only detecting it in terms of a change of amplitude wherever we have one of these Gaussian blobs positioned. So we accompany that reduction of parameters here with an increase in the number of Gaussian blobs. So initially, when we made our Gaussian blob model, our Gaussian mixture model, uh, we, we were basically just trying to fit the three-dimensional volume. You know, we put enough Gaussians in until we, we had a good fit at whatever resolution we were looking at for the Gaussian, the Gaussian volume. Um, now what we're doing is we're adding some additional Gaussians in the, the lower density regions right outside the structure. And these are mostly there to capture uh, these motions of, of objects. So it's sort of a motion detector. So you've got, you've got a Gaussian where the, where the data normally is in the neutral structure, and then you have another Gaussian next to it. And if the blob moves there in a particular particle, then you detect that as an increase in intensity there. Uh, so once we do that, once we have the increased number of Gaussians and we limit ourselves only to a single uh, amplitude variable, we actually get much better results in terms of the latent space. So let me show you that. So this is the IP3 receptor. This is actually just a screenshot of the program that we use now. We, have it, we now have a, when it was published, we didn't have this yet, but we now have this nice GUI program you can use to explore all of these parameters and such. Uh, so we're looking at here, I know it's not square, but what we're, lo we're looking at here is the latent space. And uh, what we're looking at is two, pro uh, basically a projection of the, of, of the latent space. So it's a four-dimensional latent space uh, you can do PCA on it to find one nice plane. Uh, what we're looking at here is just one of the orthogonal projections of the four-dimensional latent space. So this is what it looks like when you put the 399,000 uh, particle images from this IP3 receptor data set in. Uh, and uh, it doesn't look terrific. It just looks sort of like a blob. Maybe there's a lobe here and a lobe here, but it, it doesn't give very good separation. That's what the original GMM program did. Now with the new improvements that we've made, it looks like this. So now you can see we get dramatically better separation into different classes. And actually, if we rotate in, into different orthogonal projections, you can see that the, the lobe behavior is actually even more complicated than what you're seeing here. Now, one thing I uh, didn't mention clearly earlier uh, was that to do this, the experiment for this particular, uh, uh, this particular study, uh, we were actually looking at channel activation as a function of calcium. So there were actually three different data sets. There was a low calcium data set, there was a activation sort of level calcium data set, and then there was a high calcium and inhibited level calcium data set. So we actually had three different separate populations of single particles. So some of the results that you saw before could be done with just classification based on those different data sets. Um, so what we put into the Gaussian mixture model was an equal number of particles from each of the three different data sets. 
So we didn't try to treat them separately, because if you train the Gaussian mixture, train the, the neural network on each of the separate data sets, then you have no way of relating them to each other well. So we just took all three data sets, equal number of particles, merged them into a single data set, did a single particle reconstruction on the merged data set, and then put that into the Gaussian mixture model. But what that means now is that we can actually identify which particles came from each of those data sets, and then how that maps into the latent space. So if we do that, oh, this is, an, this is sorry, this is one, a different orthogonal projection. So you can see some of this additional complexity that exists. So this is the projection that we'll use for looking at the, uh, the, the different subsets. Okay, so this now we have three different colors shown. The three different colors, I know the yellow is a little hard to see, but I'll, I'll, I'll split them out in a second here. Uh, so you've got red, green, and yellow. And those are the three different populations of particles that went in. And you could already tell that it's not isotropic, but it's also not what you might suspect. You'd say, oh, well, you see three different bands, and you had three different data sets. It's probably one band for data set, for data set or something like that, right? Nope. Uh, here's the red data set. You can see it sort of clusters on the edges of these two lobes. Here's the green data set. And here's the yellow data set. So there's tremendous overlap between all three of these different data sets. And that gets back to what I was talking about, IP3 receptor not being energetically driven. It me, it's, it's basically looking at different entropic neighborhoods. So the, the entropic neighborhoods, sort of as represented by the whole distribution that you see for all the particles, uh, you know, they're spanned by the data set, but each individual data set only covers a portion of it, or at least has a higher probability covering different portions of the data set. Right, so there's the whole data set again. There is red, green, and yellow. Right. Okay. Um, the other thing that's very nice about the Gaussian mixture model uh, is, oh, hang on, let me, I'll go forward again to this next slide, is as you can see, there are Gaussian blobs shown over here, just a pattern of Gaussians, and it looks very much like that IP3 receptor look down, you know, looking down from the top. Uh, something that you can't do in a lot of the other manifold learning methods, so in, the other, in, in most of the other manifold methods, uh, if you have a distribution in a latent space like, like this, uh, and you want to understand what the different lobes correspond to structurally, you basically have to classify them. You have to take a region and then reconstruct all the particles that are, are from that region, and then you get a 3D map out. But that means that you have to do a whole bunch of different 3D reconstructions all over the data set. With a Gaussian mixture model as an intermediate, we can directly generate a Gaussian configuration from any point in the four-dimensional latent space. So, right, so this is a live demo from the software. I mean, I'm not doing it right now, but I recorded it. And you can see, as you just drag the mouse pointer around, you can immediately see the reconfiguration of the Gaussians in space that that corresponds to. You can still do the next step. You can then take each of those regions, and then you can do a 3D reconstruction and look at the structure corresponding to that as well. And you can make sure that that, 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 uh, that, that corresponds to what you're expecting. Uh, but uh, uh, you can immediately get a sense of of what's happening and what sort of flexibility and dynamics exist in the system without having to, to go through that time-consuming process. And of course, if you get disagreement between the Gaussian model and the 3D reconstructions, then you know something funny is going on. So it's an additional sort of confirmation that your mathematical modeling is all working the way you expect. All right, so here's, here's an example now if you do the clustering. Uh, here's one cluster that was pulled out of the four-dimensional space. Again, we're just looking at a projection, so uh, it, it'll look like they overlap, but in reality in 4D space, they're, they're, they're not overlapping. So here we now see a, a projection, and uh, this is just a slice through one layer in that orientation. Uh, and there's another class. So you can just see how two of these different classes relate. You can see the sort of twisting motion that's undergoing uh, around, around the axis in some of these loops, some of these lobes. And I could take you through more of this. We could spend hours just sort of staring at, at different pretty pictures. But this, this gives you a feel for sort of the sorts of things that you can do now with this Gaussian mixture model. So I don't have time to take you through any of the subtomogram averaging stuff today. And it's still kind of a work in progress. We do have it working on subtomogram averaging. Uh, so uh, we have one, uh, the canonical data set that we, you, that we use to sort of as a tutorial for people doing the, the subtomogram pipeline, which is uh, ribosomes. Uh, so it's basically just single particle specimen, but then it was, it was imaged using tomography. Uh, and then we do subtomogram averaging. Uh, 
uh, you can use this method very nicely to separate out the ratcheting motion, and you can actually pull out bad particles from the data set and stuff like that. So it, it actually is working very nicely right now. And the way we achieve the subtomogram averaging result is, so for each particle we have one of these sub-tilt series, so what we do is we compute the gradients for each of the images in the sub-tilt series, then we average all of the gradients together, and then all of the tilts in the subtilt series have that, that single average value as their representation. So basically all of the, the, the entire tilt series is forced to map to the same point in latent space, even though we're not explicitly treating them as 3D particles. We're still, we're still treating the data as it, the raw 2D data. Okay, uh, that's it. This is my last acknowledgement slide. This is, these, these are the people in the, in the, the, the core that, I, that, that I, I direct at Baylor now who uh, were involved in collecting some of the data that we're looking at. Uh, Zhao is the co-director. Uh, and I, we need to thank the Beckman Foundation who bought us our, our uh, uh, who is buying us a fluorescent module for our, our cryo fibsim and is buying us a high pressure freezer and the CPRT grant which funded our, uh, our, our uh, cryo fibsim and then my grant uh, from the uh, GMS to, uh, to do all the software development work. And that's it, and uh, thank you.